Hello, is that the right? Brilliant, thank you. Hi, great to see you all. Um, yes, apologies, this has uh, never happened to me before, but there's a first time for everything. Just as I was about to come on, my, I accidentally uh, accepted an update, and so my laptop is currently updating, which is great. Um, but thankfully, I had another copy of the slides. Uh, ignore the fact that this says Hay Festival, that's where I was last week, but it's effectively the same talk. Um, so, uh, I <laughs> um, hope you can bear with me on that. Unfortunately, the uh, PowerPoint I had, which has videos in, also um, is not uh, able to run on this machine. So, uh, I'm going to just describe what you would be seeing in the videos, <laughs> and hopefully you can use your imaginations. Um, so, yeah, this talk is about uh, something I did when I got really bored in lockdown. Uh, I've been uh, locked away in my, in my uh, home during COVID-19, and I wanted to do something not just looking at the computer screen, um, but something I could build myself, um, but it had to be something I could put together in my living room um, because we were, we were kind of trapped and couldn't go to a workshop or anything. So I wanted to build my own Enigma machine. So. Um, the Enigma machine is a type of mechanical computer. Um, you can think about mechanical computers from, from ancient uh, civilizations. This is the Antikythera mechanism that the ancient Greeks used to, uh, to predict the movement of the stars. Uh, this is a very simple mechanical computer. It adds one. You can think of it as a type of computer in that sense. Uh, there are also more sophisticated mechanical calculators and so on. But the kind of mechanical computers that I'm super interested in, because my research is all about privacy and security and surveillance, um, is the uh, cipher machines that were used to encrypt communications in, uh, in the world wars um, and, and right up until um, quite, uh, quite uh, late on in the 20th century. Most famous of them is probably the Enigma machine. So this was a, a mechanical cipher machine that was used, um, it, was, it was invented at the end of, this, of the First World War, and it was used heavily in the Second World War, notably by the German army. Um, so the, what's important about the Enigma machine is that it, it enabled a, a different type of um, cipher than was historically used by military. So um, if you go back to the Caesar cipher, which was supposedly used by Julius Caesar, um, this was what's called a substitution cipher. So you take each letter in the alphabet and you substitute it with another letter in the alphabet. Now, this kind of cipher has an important weakness, which is, which is that you can count the occurrence of different letters. Um, and there was a, a Muslim philosopher, mathematician called Al-Kindi, who noticed in, I think, in the 12th century um, that you could, if you look at any language, there'll be some letters that are more frequent than others. So in English, the letter E is very common. So if you take any uh, cipher text and you know that it was originally written, the, the, the um, plain text, the, the message that was being sent was originally written in English, then you look for the most common substitution letter in the ciphertext, and that's probably uh, going to be an E. So you, using that method, you can actually decipher uh, what the, what the um, text is. So that's a, a weakness of substitution ciphers. Um, and what, um, one way around that is to use a polyalphabetic cipher. So polyalphabetic means that every time you use a letter, it will come out as a different encryption. Now, it's very difficult to, to do this um, using you know, pen and paper, using your, your, your brain. It's very difficult to keep track of, well, how many times have I used E? Because the recipient of your message also needs to keep track of how many times they've used E. And if you make a mistake in counting, you're going to end up uh, messing up that, that signal. So uh, an Italian architect, um, Alberti, in the uh, 15th century, came up with this uh, uh, polyalphabetic cipher method where you'd have a, a mechanism that was a, effectively two disks that could spin um, around. And this basically told you which letter to substitute. So uh, A could be G, but then you'd move the inside disk around one place, and the next time you use A, it would be something different. Um, so that was the polyalphabetic cipher disk that Alberti invented. And the Enigma machine runs on a very similar principle, um, but it uses electri electronic components or electrical components um, alongside the uh, uh, wheel rotor turning mechanism. So it's an electromechanical computer. Um, 
So inside each of the rotors, there are a series of contact pins on, on each side, and then uh, wires in the middle that take the input from one of the contact pins, which represents one of the letters in the alphabet, and scrambles that to another letter in the alphabet, so that the current that comes in that might represent a letter A will come out as a different letter at the other side of the rotor. And you don't just have one rotor, but you have many of these rotors. So the, the, these rotors are stacked together. And so what comes in from the keyboard of the Enigma machine as a letter A might come out as a letter G. And then the rotors would, at least one of the rotors would move by one position. So if you type A, A, the next time you get A, it's gonna come out as something different, like a C. Um, the Germans also uh, added another layer of security, which was the, the plug port. So this basically allows you to, ch to add an additional uh, sort of layer of encryption by changing the, uh, any letter to any other letter. Um, so that was the, the plug board to add an additional layer of security. And if you think about it, if you've got three rotors that can be in any one of 26 positions, 26 letters of the alphabet, that's 26 times 26 times 26 for the three rotors. Um, so I think that comes out uh, at 17,000-ish uh, uh, possible states. Um, you also have to take into account that those three rotors could be in, in different positions. There's six different ways you could put those together. So that takes it to somewhere around 17,000 states. And then the plug board adds even more possible states onto that. Um, so as I said, it's an electromechanical device. Um, I thought I'd start off by looking at the uh, mechanical part at the heart of the machine. So that's the rotors. I wanted to just, first of all, just try and make, see, understand how the rotor mechanism worked. So I wanted to build something that would do that. Now, how the mechanism works is that, as I said before, every um, time you type one letter, the rotors have to move, at least one of the rotors has to move by one position. So normally that's the first rotor moves by one position every time. But once the first rotor has done a full rotation, in order to actually make a, uh, any advantage of the other rotors, those rotors need to turn by one position. So once rotor one has gone round once, rotor two moves round one position, and so on for rotor three. So I decided to build uh, my own uh, rotor mechanism, stepping mechanism, so I used um, old bits of MDF that I had left over from my kitchen. Um, I made these little um, rotors that turn with a little ratchet and pull mechanism. Um, that's what that looked like. Now you could kind of use this as a sort of Enigma machine by tracing the positions of the rotors relative to each other and sort of reading off the, the numbers. Um, I've got a video here which, which won't play because unfortunately I don't have the, the PowerPoint working. But this is um, effectively you press down on the paddle at the back, which is like imagining what the key pressing mechanism would, would do. Um, and that rotates the rotors by one position each time. There's a little um, uh, sort of uh, pull underneath that stops the rotor from going too far around. Um, so that was, that was my first attempt at understanding part of the Enigma machine. Um, but what I learned is that I just wasn't able to cut anything precisely enough. Um, not only was, was my, my, my um, cutting skills not up to the scratch, but I think using you know, um, old MDF is probably not the best material to be, to be using for this kind of thing. So um, that was sort of my first experiment. Um, I thought I need to get out of the world of like pen and pencil, which is how I'd been measuring things even out of the world of just drawing stuff, which is what you get when you have like raster graphics. Um, but I needed to get into the world of vectors where you, you can mathematically define the shapes that you want to create. So by, uh, um, by designing my new parts on the computer, I could get to the, the perfect world of, of, of vectors and that would give me hopefully the precision that I needed. Um, so I started designing this, uh, this uh, my, my, my new design for the rotors um, on the computer. This was the design for the, the keyboard, the lamp board, and the plug board. And so by designing these things on the computer, I could then transition to printing them out or, or cutting them out using a laser cutter. Um, now this video just shows you the laser cutter in operation. This video is another one, angle of the laser cutter cutting out the lamp board. Um, Again, apologies, the videos aren't working. What you get out of that, you take out of the, the laser cutter is a sheet of cut uh, uh, three mil MDF. So these are all the parts that I needed to put together my system. Um, this is one of the rotors after I've put it together. So you've got these parts just slot together, kind of like an Airfix set. Um, so that was nice, I could just, could just uh, uh, work on that in my living room. You see these little springs um, with contact 
pins on the end. That's to make sure that when I push the rotors together, there's a nice firm contact so that the current can pass from one rotor to the next. Um, so that's, that's the sort of mechanism in the middle, the mechanical mechanism. What about the uh, keyboard and the plug board? So I allowed myself to make use of modern components. So I was kind of cheating here that compared to the original um, Enigma uh, creators, I was able to use these kinds of modern components that are very cheap and still available during the uh, global chip shortage um, that we were experiencing in recent years. So I, I also made use of breadboards. So these are very easy to prototype things on. I haven't really done any electrics, electronics before, so it was very useful to be able to, to play around with these things. So this is an example of, of what the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the keyboard and um, lamp board aspect of the machine looks like as I was building it. So how do, how do these things fit together? So, once you press one of the uh, letters on the keyboard, that needs to send the current through to the, to the series of rotors. So this is the entry wheel. So this is each one of these little wires that looks like jellyfish um, uh, uh, tendons or whatever you call the jellyfish's feet, arms, uh, is sending current through into the rotor. Um, then rotors in the middle look like this when you, before you put them together. So these wires are scrambling the signal coming in from one end and out the other. Uh, this is how the rotors slot together. So you, I made them so that they would fit together nicely so that when it's locked into one position, you're not gonna, um, it's not going to um, move around. Um, this is called the reflector. So once the current's gone through all three rotors, it then needs to be sent back down um, into the machine to light up one of the lamps to show you what the ciphertext letter is. So this is the, the, um, the reflector which sends the signal back down into the, the same rotors. Um, now, as I mentioned before, the German model of the Enigma machine had uh, this uh, plug board at the front. Um, so I, initially, I decided I was going to build my own plug board as well. And so th the idea was that you'd be able to um, just reconfigure the plug board as you like using these jumper cables um, in between the keyboard and the lamp board. Um, so that's a, that's a video that shows how that works. Um, so you're swapping around A and B. Um, this is another video of showing you how it operates. Um, maybe if uh, you want to at the end, we can, I can show you. I've got the machine here, so I can show you how it works. Um, so this is effectively the, the first prototype. So you type in your message, and it lights up one of the lamps under these letters. Um, so that was version one. It, it worked. It was a bit cumbersome. It was a bit fragile. Um, it didn't move around very well. Um, and you can see all these wires are exposed. So that was, that was a kind of partial success. Um, but I wasn't quite happy because, um, as you can see, it's a, bit, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess. So I wanted to redesign it, make it simpler, make it more robust. Um, I realized that I'd violated uh, two of uh, Kirchhoff's principles. So Kirchhoff was a, a Dutch uh, 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 cryptographer who said, amongst other things, um, he said that in order for a cryptographic scheme or um, cryptographic protocol to be usable, it has to be portable, so it shouldn't require several people to handle or operate. I realized I kind of messed that up because it was required more than three hands to carry it around. Um, and also, it should be easy to use and shouldn't be stressful. And I was getting stressed out and realized that I'd violated this principle as well. Um, so, in fact, this is one of the things that, that caused um, the, uh, the, the, that sort of enabled the German military to be exploited, the fact that these things were quite difficult to use. Human error uh, led to various um, vulnerabilities that the, the folks at Bletchley Park could exploit when they were trying to crack the Enigma code. So, um, as I said before, this, this plug board was also not very usable. Um, so, different ways that you could use this plug board, the, the, the Germans opted for um, not this design, which is, which is more theoretically secure, 403 septillion different ways that you could have your Enigma machine with this design. Um, they also rejected this one, which was slightly less secure, but a little bit easier to use. And then ended up going with this one, which is the least theoretically secure, but the easiest to use, where you have a reciprocal plug. So A goes into B, B goes into A. Um, so they ended up going for the, the, the more usable and less theoretically secure option. And I realized, you know, to wire this plug board together and the wiring underneath was just a complete mess. So I, I gave up on that and I thought, I'm going to return to the simplicity of the original uh, commercial Enigma machine. So this didn't have a, a plug board at the front. So that was my, my sort of uh, version two. So this, this is the one I've got with me today. It's a lot more robust, uh, and it's easier to put together and, um, yeah, uh, much better from that perspective. 
Um, so this is another video that doesn't work, but effectively what happens in this video is I type the plain text, hello, and you'll see the ciphertext. So these letters in the middle light up and tell you what the ciphertext is. And in this case, the ciphertext is J-M-A-E-K. You'll notice that A and E are different, even though the input letter L is the same. And that's because you've rotated the rotor by one position as you type those letters. Um, this is, as I said, this is a, a talk that I gave last week, so these are not the correct slides. I go into some of the history of the breaking of the Enigma machines. This is the Polish Cypher Bureau's machines that they built to break the Enigma machine. Um, this is a reconstruction from the University of Cambridge, another reconstruction um, of, the, of the bomber machine that was a precursor to the, the um, Bletchley Park bomb. That's that machine there, the Bletchley Park bomb. This then led to the creation of the Colossus machine, which broke the Lorenz cipher, which was a successor to the Enigma. Um, and f fascinatingly for me, um, these electromechanical cipher machines were still in use. Um, despite being invented in 1923, uh, uh, they were still in use um, right up until the 19, uh, si late 1960s in the US and even the, the 1990s um, by the USSR. Um, despite the fact that at this point computers were, uh, you know, modern electronic digital computers were available that could uh, simulate, you know, all these um, millions of combinations of, um, of wirings of the Enigma machine and break it very easily. We were still using these uh, quite, quite late on. Um, so that's really kind of testament to, to how powerful these electromechanical machines could be. Um, Obviously, they were used to, to hide some quite horrible atrocities. This is the Hoffel telegram, which was sent to Eichmann by one of the uh, German generals who was responsible for um, uh, organizing the concentration camps. Today, we see that, you know, Cryptography is still used to, to hide uh, government atrocities. Um, this is the faces of uh, people detained in Uyghur detention camps in, in China. Um, this was obtained by a hacker who managed to break into the Chinese systems. Um, but obviously also governments are uh, actively trying to break encryption at the same time. Um, so the encryption that we all rely on to communicate with each other safely and securely, uh, governments are trying to break that, partly to try and catch terrorists and criminals. Five minutes? Oh, I'm finished. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. But also to, to, to clamp down on dissidents and so on. So um, I'm going to end, uh, end there. And if anyone wants to come uh, and have a look at my machine uh, and, and maybe try uh, encrypting some messages, um, please come and see me uh, at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben.